Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to yet another Africam show. Now, you may not recognize this voice, it's not Trishala. I am Lauren Arthur, and I will be your host, guide, naturalist, whatever you want to call it, for this afternoon which is really exciting. I'm very happy to be here with you all. Now, we are going to sort of move between all the different cameras, see what we can see along the way, see what animals we can find and see what sightings we can come up with. But of course, it's interactive. So you must talk to us. I want to hear from you all. You're welcome to answer your questions. And of course, you're welcome to Send in your comments, stories, whatever you like. Oh, Dean, DNC, you're saying good morning, Lauren, from Seattle. Wow, so it's morning time where you are. Zygote, you're saying hi, Afrikan. Hi, Zygote. All in trouble, you're saying hello from Washington State. You're ready to bumble over the cams. That's great. I love the word bumble. I'm not even in South Africa right now. I'm in Scotland, but we are still essentially bumbling. We are still moving through the cams and seeing what we can find. That's the most amazing thing about this is you almost feel like you're in nature, even when you're at home. Sergeant Pepper, good morning from rainy Florida. I'm sorry to hear it's raining. It's actually very sunny in Scotland right now. I'm not going to lie. I'm very happy with that. Michael S, you're saying hello from North Carolina. It's good to see you all. Good to see you too, Michael S. And you are welcome. We love to share all the wonderful animals with you too. So right now we are in a sort of area, sort of, that I know very well, and that is the Kruger. So this is lots of buffalo here in the Kruger Shalati. A lot of buffalo. Gemma, good day to you too. And you're in New Jersey. Wow. A lot of people from the US here. Kathy and CO, you're from Colorado. Good to hear from you all. Now, Buffalo, I will be honest, at the start of my career as a guide, I, I liked Buffalo. I liked them, but I wasn't entirely drawn to always spending time with them. And it, it wasn't until recently, maybe a few years into my career, that I realized they are absolutely fantastic. And the more time you spend with buffalo, the more you appreciate their funny facial expressions, their sounds, their behavior, their interactions, their umwelt, their sensory world. And I have to say, buffalo now rank right up there with my top sort of animals to spend with. Spas, good to hear from you. I hear from you normally when I'm on Wild Earth and you're saying, hi, Lauren, hello, and what a great start, absolutely. Trudy, you're saying hello from Michigan. Wow, this is just incredible. Jan, or is it Jan? I'm gonna go with Jan, but you're saying, oh, yay, hi, and you're from Tucson, wow. Bob, you're from Kalamazoo. Good day to you too. Wow, looks like we're on to two of the big five now. These Ellie's are at Tao. Very different landscape. It's very dry here, I must say. Let's just watch them for a moment. Yeah, watching elephants drink is one of my favorite things to do. Sarah, I just want to say hi to you because you're from Kazakhstan, which is really, really interesting. When I was doing my master's at university, it was myself, a Scottish girl, and five Kazakhstanis. So I lived in a house with five people from Kazakhstan, two girls and three boys, and we're still friends to this day. It was just an absolute, yeah, it was an incredible year. Not so well behaved, but we won't go into that, Sarah.
and Ontario, Canada, Joan Finley. Wow, hello to you too. Now, Kathy and CO, you're asking about the minimum depth of water needed for crocodiles to survive. And that's interesting because I would say that water is crucial for crocodiles, absolutely, but they can survive in quite low water levels, Kathy, depending on the temperature. It's actually temperature of the environment, the ambient temperature that's more important well, it ranks over water levels. I just came back from Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape, <laughs> definitely not in Scotland, in South Africa. And they actually don't have crocodiles there and they never have, even although they do have some water bodies that could potentially hold crocodiles. And it's not due to water levels. They have an all year round rainfall. It really is due to temperature. It is just too cold for crocodiles. And of course, they're reptiles, exothermic, but it's not really that, it's the eggs. Now, with reptiles, I always remember turtles are hot chicks and cool dudes. So anything above 30 degrees, 30 is your sort of baseline Celsius, that is not good with Fahrenheit, please forgive me. Um, sort of 31 and above, you get hot chicks, you'll get females for the eggs. And anything about 29 and below is cold, so you'll get cool dudes. And therefore, crocodiles are actually the opposite. It doesn't really work as well. Hot dudes, cool chicks. It just doesn't work, does it? But still, that's how I remember it. So the temperature has to be a reasonable sort of level in order to produce both of these sexes. Of course, it doesn't work like that for mammals, like elephants. But for reptiles, it does. They're temperature dependent when it comes to determining sex. So if the temperatures are just too cold, the eggs are not going to be able to develop properly or if they just always stay cold then you're always going to get females and that's a huge problem right now especially with global warming and sea turtles so that's why temperature kathy is actually more important than water levels but of course they do need water but they can survive in quite low low water levels even in Juma and the Sabi Sands, when I worked there, the water levels dropped quite low, but there was still enough moisture so they could sort of cover themselves in mud. And it was still enough moisture for them to survive, although there wasn't visible water for us to see. Hello, Susan from Montana. John, you're in Florida. Oh, how I wish. Chet, I'm wondering if that's how you say your name. Chet. With a little Afrikaans twist on that, because you are from the Netherlands after all. Hello, hello. The water levels do look low here, but it's also difficult to tell because we're not getting the whole view of the dam. But I mean, that's normal in a lot of areas in Southern Africa, at least for winter. We still are in winter, not in Scotland, but in, in South Africa, at least in Southern Africa, it's still winter. So a lot of areas, not all, of course, wait for summer for the rainfall to come. Oh, Susan, you're saying you once walked into a herd of buffaloes. Wow. And they seemed quite comfortable, but they ran away not because of you guys, but because of a leopard. <laughs> Well, oh no, sorry, that's not from you, that's from Diane and Philippe. Well, to be honest, it's down to habituation. Now, the elephant that we're looking at, the buffalo, even lions, even rhino, um, leopards, hyenas, lots of different animals, especially the ones that would be considered dangerous, are they can become habituated. Now, I was reading up recently, I'm obsessed with animal intelligence and cognitive function in the sensory world. And there's a lot of proof now that elephants actually suffer from PSTD, a PT, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And it really affects their behavior going into adulthood. So for example, if you have a calf that has a really, really bad interaction with a human or a vehicle, it will carry that through life. So as an adult, whether it's a male or a female, it may be quite aggressive 
towards vehicles or towards humans. And that's because of the stress it suffered. And I actually believe that goes across the board and it's not just elephants, they're just easier to study. So going back to habituation, whether it's intentional or not, a lot of animals can become habituated. They just realize that humans on foot are not dangerous. They're not gonna harm you or generally humans shouldn't harm. So a lot of animals will become relaxed, especially in areas like the Kruger, like the Sabi Sands, many of the animals there are relaxed to humans on foot and in the vehicle. And that's just because over the years they've never experienced fear or threats or danger from both of these things. So regards to your question, Diane and Philippe, the buffaloes are obviously accustomed to you in that area, I'm not sure where you were, and they know that you guys are not the threat. I'm sure they'll always be watching you as they will watch everything, but you guys are not the threat. And of course, a leopard is a leopard is an enemy. Lions are the enemy. They're all threats, they're danger. So that's why the buffalo would have reacted very, very different from how it was towards you guys and how it was towards the leopard. So I hope that answered your question. Rachel, Jimmy Boland, you're saying South Carolina here, love these elephants. Me too, Rachel. I've just picked up the most fantastic book called An Immense World. And it's all about the sensory world of animals and how we as humans can try and tap into that. And of course, oh, ostrich, would you look at that? That's amazing, two male ostriches and an elephant. Ah. Oh. That's incredible. Oh, and another elephant. Wow, we're surrounded here. I wonder if he'll react to the ostrich. Let's watch. Nope. Nope. We're chill today. We're chill. Sometimes elephants can be very reactive, especially the younger ones, and they're not too happy with things, especially birds. I love ostrich so much. They're just the fantastic example of evolution in birds. And I just came back from spending time in Amakala, and there was one male ostrich and three chicks. And that's it. That was the family unit. There was no female, there was no, there obviously was a mother, but something had clearly happened to her. And it was just the three of them. The father was, uh, was raising the chicks and that's just an incredible thing to see. We're not so familiar with seeing paternal care, at least in mammals. It is far more common in birds, but it was just wonderful to see in those ostrich. Rolling trouble, you're seeing PTSD is not fun and it's so sad hearing Ellie's get it. Yes, absolutely. Humans suffer it too in all sorts of different degrees. It's, it's a huge spectrum and it affects us all differently. And I think when you take that and apply it to an organism, you realize, oh, it's obviously going to affect them in different degrees as well. And it's obviously going to sort of affect different individuals differently. So that's why it's so hard to study. It's so hard to just put a generalization across all the animals, because of course, each individual elephant may suffer stress in a different way. So rolling trouble, I agree. And I don't think it's just elephants. I really don't. Well, hello, zebra. We're now at cat eye. Looking at some fan fantastically colored animals. The plain zebra, I think. Oh, we having a scratch. <laughs> Imagine not having hands or fingers and you do have to sort of scratch your body in any way that you can. You are definitely going to use falling over branches like that. Grumpy old man, good to hear your name. And you're right, Jamie wrote a fantastic article um, on Africa Geographic about habituating, habituating leopards. I saw that and obviously it was sort of brought up because of what happened to Hosanna, a leopard that many of us know. 
and it is a fantastic article. I, I won't go into the detail, we didn't have time right now, but I recommend everybody reads it. Jamie was, in fact, my mentor. And Jamie plays a huge part in the guide that I am today and a huge part in hyenas being my absolute favorite animal. Ace of bats, you were asking about those ostriches. Sorry, I knew they were male immediately because the males and females actually look very different. The males are black in color. And when I say black, I mean really rich black, almost like the color of the zebra stripes. You know that deep, deep black that you could almost just fall into. And females are a completely different color. Ace of bats, they are brown in color, they're sort of speckled, they don't have, oh, there we go. You see what I mean about that black? It's so velvety and, and rich. Oh, I just love it. And the females look nothing like that. They blend in a lot more to the background and sort of speckled with different brands. I actually think you should Google it. And if you Google it, you'll get a really good comparison at how different the male and females actually look. So it's really easy to tell the difference. It's not, um, it's not a tricky one for ostrich. Sergeant Pepper, you are asking the name of that book. Mm -hmm. It is called An Immense World. It's by Ed Yong. And it's all about how animals' senses reveal hidden realms around us. And if any of you have listened to me before, it's my favorite thing in the world to talk about. And that book, Sergeant Pepper, is one of the best books I've ever read. It was actually a Wild Earth viewer that recommended it to me. And I highly recommend it to all of you. Lisa White, I didn't see the mother elephant or baby laying next to each other at Oily Fans. I did not see that. I would love to see that though. You very often see this sort of young laying next to one another, but not the mothers. I really didn't see that, but I would love to, Lisa. I wonder if there are still elephants around. There might be. I love just sitting on these cams. You never know what is around the corner. When you zoom, you don't know what you're going to come across. It's nice to see ostrich around the water. I've spent time with ostrich in areas like Swalu where they just run. They absolutely flee. There is no spending time with them. And that probably will be from some form of PTSD. I'm not sure. But when it comes to seeing them relax, especially around water, it's actually really special when they're not scared and they don't run. Look at all the guinea fowl in the background as well. You could be forgiven to think that they are rocks. Oh, this ostrich is having a little dust bath, I think. Beneath that rich black, you see that sort of um, fawny, tawny color? That's the underside feathers on the wing. Now, he probably is just relaxing, but sand, gravel, dirt, probably feels really good on the body. A bit like an exfoliation for us. Some of us, maybe not all of us, but we might exfoliate, get rid of all those sort of lumps and bumps and dead skin. And it just feels good. It feels good to give your skin a good rub. It's probably what the male was doing there. Or it could be chucking sand all over his feathers to get rid of insects or dislodge some things. Or he could be anting and eating the ants as he does it. This is so lovely. 
Spas, I agree. James Hendry's articles on Africa Geographic are just the best, including Jamie. And the fact that I know them both and they were my colleagues and both were my mentors, absolutely. I read every article that comes out. Oh, hello, Yana. Spukusa. We have a young boy here. You can tell he's young. Look at those horns. He, he's about a teenager. Don't disappear. I do love in Yala's. And Spass, yes, get reading. I can give you the most... Well, I can give you a very, very long list of books to read, I can assure you. Ah, here's an older boy. You see, his horns are much longer and they've started to turn. They've started to twist around. He's still not a full sort of in his prime bull, but he's much older than we want, the one we saw just now. You don't actually get Inyala's at... Amakala, and I actually haven't spent time with them in Yala in a while, so it's very nice to see them. If you're ever unsure what antelope you're looking at, because some of them can look similar, absolutely. Just look for those long stockings, those long orange stockings, and you're going to know you're looking at an Inyala. <laughs> Barbara. Barbara in Michigan. Why, oh why? <laughs> Honestly, Barbara, I am a marine biologist by degree. I spent eight years, maybe longer actually, eight years as a marine biologist. And then I moved over to focus more on my zoology degree and became a guide. And it's very hard to just choose one animal, but out of all the organisms that I have intensely studied and spent time with, from sea turtles to manta rays to octopus to sharks, leopards, insects, hyenas honestly are the most incredible animals for me. I hate the fact that they have the reputation that they have. I hate it. It's not deserved. And I'm a big fan of sort of being the voice for those that are sort of not the popular ones. And hyenas are incredibly intelligent on levels that we don't really understand yet. They have personalities. Their dynamics within a clan is just something that is so utterly fascinating to watch. I think the Lion King and Hemingway and Aristotle and all of these people gave hyenas a really bad reputation and made them seem like giggling maniacs who just bone crushing devourers of the dead. Absolutely not. They, they hunt just like leopards, just like lions. And yes, they do scavenge just like leopards, just like lions. Yes, they do giggle, but it's just a vocalization just like the saw or the roar. They maybe are a bit smelly at times and have a slightly strange appearance, but I just think that morphologically they're very like dogs. They can behave very like dogs. And even although they are not a canid, Barbara, I don't even know how to put it in words. I just think they are absolutely incredible. The more you learn about them, the more you will be blown away at how incredible they are. I mean, many people thought they were hermaphrodites for a long time. But they're not. They've just evolved a very, very unique mechanism to allow females to dominate. It's a matriarchal system. Just like elephants, but not like elephants. Matriarchal, led by a matriarch to create order in amongst the chaos. If there was no matriarch, it would just be absolutely chaotic. But there is a matriarch. Females are completely dominant, and the males, well, I have to say, I'm kind of glad I'm not a male hyena. But Barbara, really, they are fantastic. You should just learn about them, and I'm sure they maybe won't be as creepy as you thought they would be. 
Hi, Mary Momo, you're late, but better late than never. And Cindy, you're right, such a handsome boy we're looking at here. You see his orange stockings? Everybody says that, but it's true, really, if you are confused about the antelope, there are many different species and can get a bit confusing. If you're not sure which one's the Inyala, just look for the orange stocking. No other species will have that. In Spas, you're welcome. You are very welcome. I'm very glad to be here. Seeing all the African animals from my home in Scotland and to be here with you all. Kathy Barton, I completely agree. Hyenas are incredible and I will do whatever I can as long as I live to, to, to spread that word. And people really don't like them. When you say hyenas, you see them sort of make this face and think, oh, is she real? Um, I'd love, my dream is to produce a documentary on hyenas. It really is. To just show how really wonderful they are. And Sergeant Pepper, you agree? Yes, we love hyenas. They are wonderful mothers. Extremely maternal and they just do what they have to to survive, like all sort of animals out there. I just find their in cognitive abilities to really shine through. I really see that when, when I spend time with them. I think every organism is intelligent. Really, I do. Intelligent as they need to be. Even a mosquito in the world of mosquitoes. Even a butterfly in the world of butterflies. And a, a lion in the world of lions. Every organism is intelligent. It's crazy that people think that some could be stupid or dumb. But when I spend time with hyenas, their intelligence just shines through for me. Ah, oh, and talking of intelligence, looks like we've got more Ellie's coming in at Tau. I can't believe how dry it looks there. Coming from the Eastern Cape, it's very lush. Very, very lush there. <laughs> Lots of moisture, year-round rainfall, completely different habitat, completely different biome, but I'm just a little bit surprised at how really dry it looks. And this, of course, does affect the Ellie's. They will have to adapt their diet. Makes them a little bit more stressed. Their behavior changes slightly. Because they're not getting that nutrition. Food is not readily available. Or food may be available, but it may not be the food that they want. They want delicious, rich, palatable, moist vegetation, and that just might not be available in winter. Oh, wow. Guinea fowl, male ostrich, and Ellie's. What a shot. Christine, you said you love spotty tainas. Whoop, whoop. Pardon the pun. I do, too. What a way to end a fantastic show. Far too quick, I must say, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Taking a bumble around all the cams that we have for you. Plenty different animals we saw. Great conversations. I think I'm going to get a cup of coffee, but I just wanted to say thank you, everyone, for jumping. I really do hope that I see you all again. Have a great day. Uh-huh. <laughs>